What's up, YouTube? This is the Big Fish Network, home for Miami Dolphin fans worldwide. I'm your host, Dave Wade, back like I forgot something with another video. It's been a lot of excitement during Dolphins training camp since day one, and that's what I'm breaking down right now, starting with day one. I heard that the offense won that day. Tua was sharp with his passes to Reed, finding them on the 35 yard over the shoulder, and Tyreek's presence has just been instant swagger, instant juice, instant drip, standing out as the alpha dog on this team. T Stead, he been out there taking the rookies under his wing and showing his experience. Um, I saw a video of Tua dropping a dime now, undrafted rookie, Braylon Sanders, who looks like he's trying to make this team. And uh, I talked about his potential in the post-draft video. Y'all go back and check that out if you didn't get a chance to already. I covered the whole 53 in that video, and I gave my prediction on who I thought was going to make this team. So y'all make sure and go check that out. River Craycraft is familiar with this offense and has ability, but I think Braylon is showing that he can get open with the best of the draft class. We'll see if he could possibly earn a fifth wide receiver spot on this team and push out Trent Shurfield, Preston Williams, and River Craycraft. Uh, also, Tyreek said that he think we got the fastest wide receiving core ever. And I'm starting to believe him. He damn sure got an argument, but I'm going to say that uh, this core is probably a tie with Dupe and Clayton. Uh, both Dupe and Clayton ran a 4.2. And I think Tyreek is similar to Duper, and Waddle could definitely play the Mark Clayton role in that, in that shooter split back offense and in Mike McDaniel's offense. Um, Reek also said he think defensive coordinators are going to be scared shitless. I believe they will. And I believe not only are they going to be scared shitless, but they definitely going to have some sleepless nights. They got to have they no those on deck to stay up to try to figure out how to stop us. Waddle mentioned on the interview with Willie McGinnis how even though they got the speed to hurt teams with the vertical stretch, they get so in and out of their breaks, they got enough wiggle to get out in and out of their breaks and their cuts to where, you know, they can get big gains that way also. They can take a seven yard or a slant or something like that, 75 yards to the, to the house. So it really don't matter to them how you want to do it. You can do it. Long distance, short distance, it really don't matter. I also saw Chase Edmonds uh, do an interview where he was talking about the running sets that the coaches got him working more on, which is the wide zone. And the wide zone is a staple of Mike McDaniel's scheme, which he got from Kyle Shanahan. Um, and he has, you know, Chase, Chase Edmonds has most of his experience running inside zone in Cliff Clingsbury's air raid scheme and in college. But in Mike's scheme, he got to learn how to ride that wave. You know what I'm saying? When he going wide, following the flow of traffic, following the flow of his blockers, he got to know how to ride that wave. And, you know, when he's doing that, he got to be able to find the lanes that, where he can bust through the hole open for touchdowns. And what I mean by that is, the blockers, they gonna create three different holes where he could either bounce, bang, or bend. Chase is gonna have to make a decision based on the leverage of the defenders on what option he should take as far as those three holes. Should he bounce it to the outside? Should he break or should he cut it, get cut it against the grain and, and, and go inside even though the flow is going outside? He got to be able to make a quick decision. Great running backs could do that. If he can expand that part of his game and master that, he can definitely be used every down on the series. I, I, I actually would rather have Raheem running those type of plays, but so far the coaches think that Chase can execute those. Uh, day two and day three, they say the defense showed up. I saw a highlight where Xavier Howard uh, had great coverage on Tyreek Hill. Teddy Bridgewater could have thrown a better pass on that, but it's X, man. X gonna do what X gonna do. Uh, day four practice was open to the public. Tyreek was out there doing backflips, entertaining and hyping up the fans. And there were several plays that stood out on day four. Uh, the Penguin and the Cheetah catching slants. 
throwing up the deuces. You know what I'm saying? Two and through a laser to Cedric Wilson Jr. in stride. Uh, this video of that. Noah Igbenogany and Trill Williams also made plays. And Tua found Waddle on a nice bomb over Nick Needham in coverage as well. Just dropped it in the bread basket. That's exactly what I'm talking about as far as accuracy. Uh, last year, we didn't do that enough. But you can't say that he didn't do it. Because there's several plays where we he got bombs to Waddle last year. He got bombs to uh, Matt Collins last year. So he showed that he could do this. But he's going to have to do it more, not just to, to appease the fans who think he can't do it, but he actually does have to. We, we do need to go up top a lot more in this offense, and I hope Mike McDaniel opens up that playbook. Teron Armstead was out and didn't practice on day four. They worked on jet sweeps to heel and handoffs to Waddle also, which I like. This shows that we're going to be running some exotic formations this year, and the player of the day on day four was the play and practice where the offense they was lined up in the I formation and it looks like Tyreek Hill was in motion and Tua just launched a rocket over the shoulder uh hitting Hill in stride for a 60 plus yard bomb and you just heard the crowd go bonkers and that's what I'm talking about I wish I was there to watch it uh, so far there hasn't been a lot of news on Mike Gesicki uh, he hasn't made any standout plays, but I'm not worried about Mike because we already know what Mike can do already. Day five, Teddy Bridgewater didn't do much. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if he was injured or not, but it looked like he, you know, they was holding him out for precautionary reasons. Uh, so Skylar Thompson got a lot more snaps than he did. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think he was hurt. If so, you know, like I said, it was probably precautionary that day. Uh, Michael Dieter, Adam Butler, Mostert, and Ingo were also out on day five. The standout play that I was happy to hear about on day five was a 40-yard touchdown wreck from Eric Enzukama. Two avoided pressure and found him with good accuracy. Tyreek Hill again beat Nick Needham on the crosser. And, and I say Nick, he can keep up with most receivers, but the cheat is just elite with his footwork. So I'm not worried or surprised. That's just that's just what it is. I know in the slot, Nick is a beast, but Tua's product placement is up there. And Marino says you can't defend the perfect pass. You can't defend the perfect pass. I mean, it, it, to Tua, that's the underrated skill that a lot of quarterbacks don't have that y'all just gloss over because of arm strength, which is what y'all focus on the most. But accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. As Reek said, as far as accuracy, I got two all day. Uh, day six and day seven was good, except the O-line struggled a little bit. Christian Wilkins was beating uh, Robert Hunt at times, which is good and bad. Solomon Kelly also struggled a little bit. Tanner Connor had a good day on day seven. Um, so I'm, I'm happy about that. He's one of our undrafted uh, free agents. Day eight was up and down on both sides of the ball. They worked on red zone, one-on-ones, and 11-on-11 drills. Byron Jones, he's been rehabbing, so uh, he hasn't been, been, been out there. Adam Butler got cut on day eight, uh, which I'm not too mad about. I mean, he, you know, Brian Flores brought him over from the Patriots, having some familiarity with him. Even though we got Josh Boyle in the team who's also work with Adam Butler. John Jenkins been balling in camp uh, on the D-line. I mean, y'all know me, I wanna get younger, so I, I wasn't too crazy about us keeping John Jenkins on, on the stat, on the roster, but he's been balling in camp on the D-line, so he could get more snaps. Um, what else we noticed on day eight? Uh, Connor Williams, as y'all know, has been working at center. Uh, but he's been struggling with the shotgun snaps, so that's not good. Adam Pankey's also been struggling with bad snaps. I wanted us to draft a center in you know in this draft. Uh, Alec Lindstrom or Tyler Lindstrom, either one of those I would have wanted us to get, but we didn't get. Uh, but hopefully, this is not going to be a weakness on this team. Uh, at the end of the, at the end of day eight, you saw Tua and Gasicki working together. So Gasicki, like I said, he's been quiet this camp. 
Haven't really been hearing a lot from him, but like I said, I, I'm not worried about Mike. Uh, Hunter Long has actually been getting some, some he, he been getting some plays uh, in. Teddy Bridgewater has been throwing the ball to him in camp. Uh, day nine was a mixed bag. Christian Wilkins, he wore the orange jersey. Jalen Phillips got a sack on tour. Uh, Chase Edmonds with some good runs. They worked on a lot of blitz pickup and blitz pressure on day nine and uh, some game scenarios. After 11 on 11 work, uh, Tua Teddy and Skyler had individual drills and hyped up the crowd, you know what I'm saying, by getting everybody fired up from throwing 50 yard bombs into the net. Uh, Skyler throws a pretty good high spiral bomb. I like, I like the way he, he, you know, he has a high arc on his on his passes. So, um, so far he's been a, he's been a pleasant surprise, Skyler Thompson. Um, good nose dive velocity on the ball as it was coming down into the net. Teddy threw a pretty good one too. He also, you know, was able to hit the net. His ball was kind of leaning a little bit though, so. You know, I don't know, but it's Teddy, 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 he redeemed himself. Um, today was the 10th training camp day and my favorite video, like I said, Teddy redeemed himself. My favorite video that I saw from camp today was Teddy Bridgewater firing a high arc of rocket to Tyreek Hill, who he caught it over the shoulder uh, in the bread basket again, beating what looked to be uh, like Xavier Howard, he had his jersey up, so you couldn't really tell if it was if it was him. But I, it looked like a two-five, so it looked like you know he finally got the best of Xavier on that on that catch. So you know it's been a back and forth slugfest between the offense and the defense. Some days the offense won, some days the defense won. I, I'm glad that we had that we you know we we have it like that because what it shows is balance on both sides of the ball. Um, I'm glad that we heard some of our undrafted rookies making plays. Ben Steele, Braylon Sanders, Zaquan Dre White, who's been running tough. Jalen Phillips and Christian Wilkins been visible on defense. So that's what I got for all of the training camp news. This episode is going to be the final episode in the Tua's new playbook series. The previous shows were the Shula Splitbacks, Shula's Three-Headed Monster, Bring Back the Wildcat, the Alabama RPO Pistol. If you didn't get a chance to watch those, check those out. If you're a true fans fan and you're rooting for Tua to succeed, you're gonna love those videos. After this video, y'all gonna be getting more videos from me on a regular, consistent basis. This video is great timing, and I call it Tua's new playbook, the 94 Young Seaford West Coast Offense. Now, I intentionally saved this playbook for last because if you've been rocking with me from my first video, then you already know how I feel about the West Coast offense already. It's my favorite offensive scheme. Uh, when Coach Flo got fired, I made a video on the top five coaches that I would target, and all of them were disciples of the West Coast offense. I didn't choose Mike McDaniel at the time because he just didn't seem like he had the presence to be a head coach. Um, so I was more preferring us to get Greg Roman and maybe have Mike McDaniel as the offensive coordinator. But I'm an optimist and I'm a positive fan, so I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And we finna try to take it all the way to the Super Bowl this year. Um, now, Mike is a Shanahan protege, which is a good thing and gives me reason for excitement because I have no doubt in my mind that our running game is going to be much improved. As y'all heard that, you know, the plays in training camp of them giving Chase Edmonds the ball, he's going to be real involved in this offense. I'm old enough to have seen uh, the Denver Broncos rushing attack when they had Terrell Davis and Clinton Portis. Really, no matter what back they had, he can get them a thousand yard season. Mike Anderson, a fullback, had a thousand yard season. Uh, Olandis Gary, I mean, they just had a lot of players. That's just how great he was schematically as a coach with installing the inside-outside zone. And they blocking scheme allowed for the running backs to have two or more lanes to choose from, which is what you want. I ain't gonna lie, when they had Terrell Davis, they was doing a lot of chop blocking too, which is illegal. I don't know if we'll be able to get away with that, 
this season, but if we can, man, Terrell Davis was taking it to the crib a lot of times off of those chop blocks, which they, they did get away with, but Shanahan blocking scheme is, is superb. Kyle Shanahan does uh, some of the same things in his scheme, following in his, in his dad's footsteps. I think what makes Kyle Shanahan so revered in the league is his innovation to his father's scheme and the Bill Wall scheme by adding a lot more pre-snap motion uh, to confuse the defense. The 49ers last year pretty much led the league in that. I'm pretty sure we're going to see that in our offense this year, which I look forward to. There's certain plays in a run game where you saw them in like a split back formation, whether it's iPhone or maybe iPhone with the fullback offset. And then you see Garoppolo handing Elijah Mitchell the ball and Mitchell had the option to flow with his blockers or stick his foot in the ground and cut back against the grain and gash him inside for a huge gain, possible touchdown. We should expect McDaniel to implement that to our rushing attack this season with um, I was I was hoping to hear more from Sony Michelle um, as as the lead running back on those split flow type runs, but like I said, it looked like Chase Edmonds is going to get some of those initial carries. We'll see. They may surprise us and mix it up. Uh, we'll, we'll see what they have in store. What 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 uh, Eric Stoosville is going to do? Uh, he used Trey Lance on quarterback power runs with the left tackle Trent Williams pulling to the direction of the run and being annoying to the defender, you know, the linebacker, whoever was in the way, he was knocking them off, knocking them off their squelch. And the line was crack blocking and setting the edge for good gains. I think we should run some of those same plays for Tua. He's definitely mobile enough. Uh, we've seen that. And, and you gotta be mobile in this league. What made Ryan Fitzpatrick Fitz magic was his mobility. You know what I'm saying? He was sneaky athletic. And the, that athleticism, it pretty much got, got us out of a lot of bad plays, a lot of bad situations. And he put his body on the line at times. And that's what the fans loved about Fitz magic. But even though he got us out of bad situations, he also put us in bad situations with pick sixes that lost us games. That's why he wouldn't be good in a West Coast offense because Fitz Magic is for the big play. He's not for, he don't have the patience to march you down the field and he's not accurate enough on quick timing type routes. Uh, Jimmy G is athletic, but he's more of a pocket passer. But what makes Jimmy G so perfect for the 49ers scheme when Mike McDaniel was there and was running it, uh, I mean, was helping to run some of these plays, these running plays, and Kyle Shanahan was the one calling the shots, is that he has a quick arm release. Jimmy G's is probably has a top one, a top five trigger fingers in the league um, as far as how fast that the ball comes out of his hand. He found his fullback, his tight ends on passes in the middle, and he just executed a lot of the flood concepts and the Yankee concepts in their offense. Another positive sign I saw when reviewing 49ers tape was how Shanahan used high to low concepts and triangle routing with his wide receivers to put secondaries out of position. And Shanahan caught teams with play action where they defense bit on the action fake. The tight end ran the go route, pulling the safety away from the crosser and Garoppolo finding the crosser behind the linebackers. I would love for Tyreek to be that crosser, but it could be Waddle, it could be Eric, it could be whoever. Uh, that's what makes me excited about this season. Our wide receiver room is West Coast ready, and I can see Hill, Eric said, or Jalen being the crosser. It really don't matter. God forbid if Waddle or Hill were to get injured, I can see us still being successful in the West Coast passing game. Um, you look at their tape back last year with the with uh with Debo Samuels, he was usually the crosser. And Debo did a good job. He moved, they moved him around similar how they used to move Jerry Rice around in the 80s and the 90s. Now, if you go back to the 90s for a minute and take a look at that 1994 San Francisco 49ers team, they had left-handed quarterback Steve Young leading them to the Super Bowl. Mike McDaniels around my age, so he saw this team just like I did, and it was one of the greatest teams in football history. 
the 1994 and I say the 96 Niners squads are two of my favorites. But on all three sides of the ball, they was legit. I think this team could be similar to that team uh, the way that we're built right now. You look at who they had on defense with Deion Sanders shutting down one side of the field. I think Xavier Howard has earned the respect of the quarterbacks around the league to where he can pretty much do the same thing. And they had safety Merton Hanks who had great awareness, anticipation, and closing speed. That's why you saw Hanks picking off passes, doing the Fraggle Rock dance, taking it to the crib. Javon Holland is a ball hawking safety that we have on our team. I think he could be similar. He got the range he showed last year that he can go zero to 100 real quick from sideline to sideline. Um, then you look at their linebackers, Ken Norton and Gary Plummer, they were excellent linebackers. Gary was underrated, made a lot of impact plays, had a nose for the football. And I think our current linebacking core is, is more versatile than theirs as far as pass coverage. If rookie Channing Tindall can be a player early for us, this defense could be top five, without a doubt. On the D-line, they had a uh, big defensive tackle, Dana Stubblefield, and they had Brian Young at defensive tackle with Tim Harris at defensive end, Ricky Jackson and Bet Richard Dent. We obviously need more depth on the D-line, and I, I fully expect Chris Grill. Chris, make sure you get us some D-line help, man. We need another defensive tackle like Christian Wilkins to go. We need another Christian Wilkins. Um, then you look at the offense, they had Jerry Rice and John Taylor, wide receiver, both on the boundary with Ed McCaffrey as they slot receiver. All three had sick route running ability and could create separation. And John Taylor was highly underrated. He was just as dangerous as Rice. It was almost like having Jordan and Pippen. Tight end Brent Jones had a similar build to Gasicki and he was a threat. He also helped that offense become a well-oiled machine which is why I don't listen to the opinions of certain media hosts that cover the team regarding the Siki. Cause I seen it, I seen this work already on tape with his skill set. Uh, in the backfield, they had running back Ricky Waters, who in my opinion is one of the top five West Coast running backs of all time. Not only did they play, did he play with the Niners and produce, he also played with the Eagles, the Seahawks who also ran the West Coast offense and produced as well, breaking the century mark in consecutive years. 1994, he gained 877 yards on 200 carries. And if you ever watched him play, you know that he brought a lot of energy and juice to that 49ers offense. He was also dangerous as a wide receiver as well. Along with him, they had kickoff returner and, and running back Dexter Carter, who they used. Running back Mark Logan, who played with the Dolphins under Shula was also on that team, and fullback William Floyd, who they used to call bar none, toting that rock, running cats over. They just had the full gamut of weapons for that offense. Uh, William Floyd is, is what we missing on this team, but I do think Ingo can play that juice set role for sure, so it's gonna be interesting. Lastly, you analyze Steve Young's game tape and accolades. 1994 was his best season when he posted a then record 112.8 passer rating by completing 325, or actually 324 of his 461 passes for 3,969 yards and 35 TDs. I mean, that's legendary. Young also added seven rushing touchdowns as he guided the 49ers to the NFC West title with the 13-3 record. The team then coasted through the postseason. In the NFC Championship game that year, Young threw two touchdowns, rushed for one as the 49ers down the Dallas Cowboys 38 to 28. I saw that game live. Cowboys tried to come back, but it was just too late. He topped off the year with an incredible performance in San Francisco's 49 to 26 win over the San Diego Chargers in that Super Bowl. Young passed for 325 yards and threw a Super Bowl record six touchdowns. Uh, he also was the game's leading rusher with 49 yards on five carries. For his efforts, he was named Super Bowl's most valuable player. Now this same year, the Miami Dolphins, we went 10 and six. We beat the Chiefs in the wild card round, but we lost to the Chargers by one point. So really, 
that Super Bowl could have been another Dolphins versus 49ers Super Bowl uh, as it was when Marino went to his first Super Bowl, but he lost. We could have been there. I think we would have put up a much better fight than the damn Chargers in the Super Bowl. Uh, but Marino had, you know, he did have a wide receiving core similar to this one as well with wide receivers, Urban Fryer, Mark Ingram, and OJ McDuffie from the Fish Tank, um, and Scott Miller. Then at tight end, they had Greg Beatty, Keith Jackson, and Ronnie Williams. Uh, if Keith Byers and Terry Kirby would have never got hurt, I do believe that it would have been a different outcome. But as far as beating the 49ers, even though I say we would have put up a better fight than the Chargers, we could have won against the 49ers, but I don't know, man. It, it just seemed like destiny for them. Once they got Dion, it was pretty much a wrap. Um, but both teams had success running the West Coast, like I explained in the past. The difference I see in Shula's version was that Shula's version of the West Coast was more vertical with shorter receivers on the outside, Duper and Clayton both being under six feet, but got elite track speed. Um, that's what I want us to do. If we run the Shula's version of the West Coast at times, depending on who we play, is have Tyreek and Waddle, even though they're short, have them on the boundary, not in the slot, in the boundary with Eric and Zukama, the bigger receivers, the six two ones, in the slot if we run four wide sets in single back in single back sets not a shotgun when you look at Seifert's version uh which is bill walsh's version his is more horizontal and he had rice lined up at fullback sometimes you know in the slot the boundary and when he did have him in the boundary rice as well as to when to took over and became that alpha receiver they were what I would consider, what I would call motion receivers. They start off on the boundary, the far boundary, Rice or T.O., and they motion to the inside. And at that point, in the West Coast, I could, I could audible to a lot of different things. I could pass it to the runner, to the fullback. You, and now that I pass it to the fullback, if he, get, he can get us four yards, a pop, every time we give him the ball, he's a threat. I can give it to the running back. Now he's a threat. That means the fullback is blocking and you gotta worry about Rice as the crosser. Or I could have Rice or T.O. in motion and I could have him release into a pattern, fake like I'm giving the ball to the fullback and find them behind the linebackers, which is what Steve Young was doing as well as Joe Montana. Now, um, your motion receiver can either be in one of those modes, that Jerry Rice mode or that T.O. mode. So six foot two or six foot three, 200 to 220 pounds in weight. To me, I don't want my motion receiver, my Jerry Rice or T.O. receiver to be no bigger than that. Cause that was exactly their heights. Rice was six two, T.O. was six three. Rice was 200 pounds, T.O. was 220. So I would say in today's league, Antonio Brown and D.K. Metcalf, are the closest comps. Even though Antonio's not quite as tall, he just remind me of Rice, the way he could get open, man. And Metcalf is definitely a T.O. clone, in my opinion. So the difference in how I would align the receivers in both the Shooters West Coast and Seifert West Coast, like I said, is that Seifert's, I would have Eric Inzukama or Cedric Wilson as the Rice T.O. receiver. So I would have them out wide. When we run the Steve Young Secret West Coast, if we were to run that, which is what I want us to run. Cedric or Eric, the taller receiver, 6'2", in motion with Waddle or Tyreek in the slot. I would put Waddle in the slot and we'll alternate between Waddle and Reek in the slot and that's gonna cause problems. They're gonna play that John Taylor role. Um, so that's a, that's a difference in how I would align them using both, e e alternating between either Mike McDaniel's West Coast, Shula's West Coast, or the C for Bill Walsh West Coast. When we run that strong and single back ace formation, I wanna see us running that stretch play. Um, when we run the far and near, we need to run the full back dive and the trap runs. Throw, the, throw to the running back, Throw to the running back, take the check down to it when it's open. 
to the running back. When Chase Edmond flares out, use him as a threat to suck in the defense and catch Gesicki on the dig, catch Tyreek on the post. You know, they because they gotta respect the running back. They gotta respect our running backs in the passing game. But once they once they bite on the flare, hit them with the hit them with the angle route with the running back. They got to respect everything. Make them look at the whole fucking field. That's what I want us to do. Um, that's, you know, and, and all of that is going to open up cover two, cover three. We're going to find them on them curls in the zone. Um, when we run the empty sets, throw the fake wide receiver screen bomb to Tyreek Hill. Two have executed that play in college. It works. Um, what I'm basically trying to do with this hyper scheme, y'all, is make it to where we're unpredictable. Unpredictable, just like mystical, unpredictable, and have different ways to move the football. I know there are fans out there that want us to just see us have a deep passing offense, but the horizontal game is just as important. You got to be able to be methodical down the field. Um, a 70 yard touchdown is a 70 yard touchdown. I don't care how you get it, y'all be surprised how a lot of these quarterbacks' numbers will look if it wasn't for yards after catch in the dink and dunk game. Um, you take away that, a lot of these quarterbacks numbers will look different. But if we get to it to learn all of these principles, all of the playbooks that I told y'all, open up the offense, and you know, I, I, I swear he will be the quarterback that we need. He's young, he's under 25, y'all be patient with him. Um, and, and, and remember, you know, he, he got a long way to go. We just got to be patient. We can't keep switching quarterbacks every three years, y'all. God damn, let's stick with one quarterback. So that's all I got for the day. Y'all let me know in the comment section what y'all think about Tua compared to Steve Young. Can he be the next Steve Young? Can he be Steve Young for the Dolphins? I want to know what y'all think. Till next time, signing off. Fins up. TBF Fins.